Influencing popular culture, politics, and everything in between. The local station takes you ringside as we discuss the crazy world that is professional wrestling. This is Going Ringside with the local station. Oh yeah, all hail the Macho King. And the Macho King is telling you right now to check out the Going Ringside podcast with Scott Johnson. Because Scottster, yeah, he's the cream of the crop, yeah. He's the man that will hold the scepter one day of all wrestling podcasts. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you know what they say about the cream of the crump? It always rises to the top because it happens so fast you can't even talk about it. Yeah. Scott, the lucky person. Uh-huh. Dig it. Yeah. Who am I to argue with the Macho King? Macho verse. on Instagram is him right there. And you can go follow him. I want to thank him. We're going to have him on a show coming up down the road but thanks for joining us today on going ringside as he said the cream is rising to the top as you keep telling your friends and family who like wrestling that the show is out there as we continue to grow once again give us a follow on TikTok or Instagram at going ringside put a lot of exclusive content there every day so thank you for joining us on the show today so excited to have you here and today I'm going to talk about a guy I've wanted to have on the show for a while, and he joined us in studio here. And if you watched WWE during the early 2000s and then TNA for many years, you probably know the name of Elijah Burke. If you're not familiar with Elijah, sit and listen to this interview. He's got a really interesting story. Elijah Burke was a former cop here in Northeast Florida. We're in Jacksonville here where we do our show. That's where he's a police officer. And he decided he wanted to try that wrestling thing because he grew up on the likes of Dusty and Rick and the Mid-South, WCW, Florida Championship Wrestling, all those guys, and he wanted to get involved. So Elijah decided to leave being a police officer and become a pro wrestler. And that's what he did for several years, very successfully, still does it today. He's doing a lot of independent work, a lot of the independent circuit, uh, does different promotions. He has a charity here in Jacksonville called the Love Alive Charity. They do a lot of wrestling events. They just had JTG at one, uh, who used to be with Crime Time not too long ago, headlining event for them. So he does a lot, but he's got a really interesting story about how he got into it, very unusual how he decided to do it. You gotta listen to this story. And then something that fascinated me about when he got into WWE that an idea that Vince McMahon had for him, and he said no. Not many guys I've met have looked at Vince in the face and said no. I don't like that idea. I wanna go a different direction. He's not just a wrestler, he's a talker. He knows how to work that mic, and you'll hear it during this interview. Um, he's just good on the mic. He's a good performer and did a lot in those early 2000s with WWE. He was on the ECW brand. He was a manager, did a lot of things. But his real uh, training came from watching Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair as a kid here in Jacksonville and then growing up to become a, a world champion at one point. So here's our interview with Elijah Burke, also known as De Pope. I've always wondered, why do you call yourself De Pope? He explains it in this interview a lot here, and you'll want to hear some of his Jim Cornette impressions. That's coming up as well. Here's our interview with Elijah Burke. So we are excited today to be joined by Elijah Burke, a.k.a. The Pope. Elijah, thanks for joining us today. Hey, man, I'm glad to be here. It's, uh, it's an honor. So we're, not all our viewers are from Jacksonville, but as you know, we're based here in Jacksonville, and that's where you're from. You grew up here. You've kind of been a fixture in this city all these years. Born and raised right here, just right on the other side of the river, if you will, right there by all of the Jacksonville Coliseum, the Jaguar Stadium, and the yeah. list goes on. So let me start, before we get into wrestling, You've had a long life that wasn't always involved in wrestling. Yeah. You were a cop before that. Yeah, you Tell know. Tell me about that. Well, um, graduated, went straight into the police academy, obviously, um, out of high school. Which high school? Uh, Ed White. Ed White. You were Ed White. Okay. Frank H. Peterson. Let's not forget them. Okay. Um, I did the little dual thing, you yeah. know. Uh, took a trade in plumbing. 
Really? Yeah, so your boy can get down and change a pipe here and there, but it was never <laughs> my goal. <laughs> it's like, look, I just want to graduate. I want to get out of school. Yeah. Didn't really have any much of a direction. My grandfather was an officer. Okay. My sister, uh, she was an officer and became a sergeant, retired a sergeant, uh, Sergeant Sh Sapp, shout out to her. And so I just followed in her footstep and I went to the police academy, went straight into corrections, and continued my education so that I could get my dual certification to become an officer. So you did, you did corrections and police? I did corrections first, got uh, certified uh, with my, because at the time you had to have a bachelor's, or you had to put in three years and have two years of college. Well, time. let me clarify. So if you were a police officer, you kind of already knew how to physically struggle with people. Oh, well, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I had my fair share of, uh, struggles, if you will, <laughs> uh, you know, so um, that just comes with the territory. What made you think as you're in wrestling, I'm going to, or I'm sorry, let me back up, as you're in police work, right. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to try wrestling. It, well, again, uh, going into law enforcement was my goal. Uh, becoming a professional wrestler was my dream. As, as so you, it was a dream before you were a cop? Well, as a kid. You man, wanted to be one when you were little. A gotcha, kid. gotcha. So uh, before we get to that, who who do you Dusty grow Rose. up? Dusty Rose. Dusty. Dusty Rose, Ric Flair, all day long. Really? That's, that's kind of uh, uh, a mixture of who the Pope character is. I want to get your opinion. You mentioned two guys that were interesting who are big in the black community who are both white. Mm-hmm. Dusty and Rick. Yeah. Is that a reality? Is that true? I've heard that so many for so many years. Rick more so today. Okay. In pop culture. Sure. Than than you know Dusty was back when, because Dusty uh, was the only thing that someone who looked like me could gravitate to, because as a, I often said, Dusty Rose was like a black man in a white man's body. Yeah. So, so. Uh, and so you're watching him on Florida Championship Wrestling? F Florida and NWA. Okay. So, uh, so we're watching Dusty Rose. He has that Southern Baptist preacher type, yeah. you know, shtick, if you will. And so the moment he reached out on television and he said, your hand touching my hand, man, I'm up there at the television as a kid and I'm touching his hand. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so so Dusty Rose was the end all be all for me, and of course Ric Flair. And obviously, those two battled like for ages. Ric Flair, Dusty Rose. Yeah. yeah. So they were the icons. They absolutely. And so, are you seeing Rick on like WTBS on the weekends, or where are you watching him at? Uh, well, sit. I was sitting with my dad. Um, you know, my dad would be in this recliner. We would be sitting Indian style on the floor, watching that little nineteen inch television. You know, with the with the aluminum foil on the antennas. That's right, Pope comes from nothing. I mean, you know, I had something because I had family and I had a loving family and we, we, we went through it together, we came out together, but it was in those times of watching uh, Saturday morning, WTBS, Superstation, and World Class Championship Wrestling, Florida Championship Wrestling, it was during those times that really drew me in. Any African American wrestlers? Ever well, there were there, and and that's what I was going to allude to, Scott. Uh, we had the uh, at my time of of young age, we had guys that we were rooting for, like Rocky King. Rest, rest I remember Rocky King, yeah. Right, but Rocky King never, you know, uh, the. Were you around, were you watching JYD? Of course, I'm, I was gonna get to JYD, Abdul the Butcher, and the list goes on. Yeah. Um, but JYD was not international at that time. JY, JYD was based out of, uh, uh, with Bill Watts territory in mm -hmm. Louisiana and whatnot. So he was big down in, in those territories, but we weren't getting them a lot up here. Uh, and you know, JYD then migrated to WWF. Yeah and became a, a big name there. Do you but, think he was a big deal at WWF? I mean, he was almost on par with Hogan for a while. He was bigger than Hogan in Bill Watts promotion. Really? He was bigger than Hogan. Yeah. Uh, he was the first black wrestler that really transcended uh, the ring and, and had, you know, awards and, and keys given to him. And, you know, in Louisiana, selling out the Superdome or whatnot. So Hogan was never, uh, that you mentioned him, 
that was cartoon for me as a kid, so I, I didn't care about them. I really? Yeah, I, I was. It was all about Dusty, Ric Flair, the Four Horsemen. You like the more realistic kind of grown-up stuff? Yeah. W, uh, uh, yeah, man. W. NWA, WCW, that was, that was my thing. That was your thing. Yeah. So you decide when you, how does the formation when you're a police officer like, I'm gonna try this? Okay, so um, again, I started in correction and all of our goals is to get out and get to the street. So you have to, once you're certified in correction, you, certify, you work towards your certification for law enforcement. So you have to, and police officer, same thing. So um, it was during that time of my completion of, uh, of getting the accreditation that I needed that my sister was struggling a little bit with raising her kid. Mm -hmm. um, I had a sister that passed away. Okay. And um, I wanted to be there for the kids because they're my kids, I call them. They're my nephews and nieces, but they're my kids. Uh, so um, I was more focused on them. And I said, okay, um, I can't work all the hours with the law enforcement and, and do all that stuff. Um, so once I got that situated with my family in November of 23, I left in February of, excuse me, November of 203. So I was, in, in Louisville and 204 and, you know, OBW, which was the developmental system of uh, WWE, and I was making it happen. Now, let me give you the rundown real quick of how it happened. I'm booking someone into the jail. Mm -hmm. An act of God, whether you, if, or whomever you believe. Okay. An act of just a supernatural act. Yeah. Okay? And I go to the computer at intake of the uh, pretrial detention facility, and all of a sudden, across the top of the screen, says, WWE trial camp. Really? I have no idea how I got there. Uh, we this was over at the police station? This was over at the, yeah, man. So that's how, that, that started for me. Me and a friend, um, you know, I was doing the boxing here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I did the boxing, I did the guns and the hoses. Yeah. And every, so when I, when I would come out there, I went out there in my Ric Flair-ish type robes. Okay. I had robes made, you know, we weren't supposed so to So you'd that kind of become a character before this Wait, season. Yeah, yeah man. I, I was going out there boxing. I was doing the Club Five. I was doing the Tough Man competition. I was doing the Friday night fights. I was doing it all. Sometimes fighting two times, sometimes fighting Friday and fighting Sunday. Thus the record I amassed. Uh, of 98 and 1, um, thus being put in the Guns and Hoses Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. You know, that's what this nice little thing right here is. Yeah. So um, I go to the computer and I see first ever WWE tryout camp. And it's like, huh? What, what is this doing on here? And so it was already overcrowded in intake, so I take a moment to click on it and, and I print out the form like, wow, because a friend of mine, we had been discussing going down to O'Kella with uh, Dory Funk okay. and, and training in his facility. Yeah, he trained not far from here. Not far yeah. from here. So we had been talking about it, talking about it, but sometimes you got to just go for it. You, a lot of people talk, but not too many people go for it. So you go for it. Do you try out here? Is it at o Ohio Valley or whatever it was? Uh, video, uh, uh. pictures. At the time, you know, we didn't have Instagram like we have now or yeah. Facebook. So that's like a whole production to get video of yourself. Right. This, send it in. We had to mail it in. Okay, so everything got mailed in. And so it, they went through a weeding out process. It's just like a casting call. Yeah. And um, they selected 50 people worldwide, 50 people to come in and... Um, Jim Cornette was obviously involved in that process. James yeah. E, what was, is he like the same off camera? You as better believe it. Really? Better, I, I wish I could hit him up right now and have, hey Jim, I'm, what are you doing, Elijah? What's going on? So, um, yeah, he's- He's every, the James E that we think he is. Every bit of it, man. Yeah. And um, so I, I filled it out and luckily I was sitting on the dock of the bay um, with my Bay at the time, if you will, mm -hmm. and um, we were just relaxing, and it, it, we just actually fell asleep in my in my car, and the phone ring, and it's Jim Cornette, and he, I, I answer the phone, and he goes, "Hey, Elijah, it's Jim Cornette. Can you hear me?" And I'm like, 
thinking I'm dreaming because I was asleep. <laughs> that would be a dream. That's right. more like a dream than reality, right. so, yeah. So he's like, hey, hang up. I'm going to call you back to get a better reception. So I get out of the car. I stand on the waterfront. And sure enough, he calls me back. And he goes, hey, this Jim Cornette. I want to let you know you don't know a headlock from a wrist lock, but you got presence. You got something about you. You look good. You didn't lie. And um, yeah, so he liked the fact that I sent him me. I didn't send old pictures. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, that maybe when I, as some guys did, they were like this, and then mm -hmm. they show up, and they're not that anymore. And um, he knew of my boxing background. He, he said I ha had what could not be taught, and that's called an it factor. Yeah. He said, you have it. And, and that's uh, something that WWE really looks for. Really they're a, looks they're for They're a television it. company. Yeah. Yeah. And so Jim, so Jim Cornette was him and Danny Davis. Uh, you may remember. Danny Davis, the old ref? Not the ref, Nightmare Danny Davis from oh, Memphis Territory. Okay. With the star. So they were very pivotal uh, in my growth and my process. They, I mean, it was them. Uh, a, year, a year later, after being in OVW, I'm the second African-American, as they like to say, champion. Let me back up to OVW really quickly. Uh -huh. Where is that? Is that in Ohio? Louisville, Kentucky. It's in Louisville. Yeah. What was that like? Because I hear a lot about OVW, but I, is it just like an independent show like you do now, a lot of that? Because that's where Cena, Batista, Lesnar, Everybody. Orton, they all come through there. Yeah. Well, again, at that time, it was Danny Davis and Jim Cornette's thing. Mm -hmm. And WWE contracted that territory so that they can, because they got TV, man. They got TV in Indianapolis, in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. Who are some of the people in your class? Um, Jillian Hall, Melina. Really? Um, we just had Melina on, okay. Ken Doan, um, Mickey James. Okay. Um, Armando Estrada, JTG, yeah. the late, great Shad Gaspard. Yeah. And the list goes on. So many of us uh, were in that class. Yeah. So you get the call up. Is it ECW at first? SmackDown. SmackDown, OK. Yeah. Well, actually, I got called up to go to Raw. OK. Now, a lot of people don't know this. And I, uh, you know, some things I like to sh wait for the book. Scott, yeah. you're getting a lot of information. Okay, I'm excited. You're getting a lot of information here. But yeah, I was or originally called up to go to Raw. Okay. And it was to be a part of the Spirit Squad. You were going to be in the Spirit See, Squad. I should have saved it for the book. You should have saved it for the book, <laughs> but we got it here. I'd much rather it be here. <laughs> of course. So you weren't in the Spirit Squad. That would have changed the complexity of the Spirit Squad and changed the future for you, possibly. Absolutely, because I probably wouldn't be sitting here with you right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I would have been put in a box and shipped back to Louisville, Kentucky, as was the Spirit Squad. And the only Except one, yeah. Is Dolph Ziggler, my guy. Ton of respect for, still, in my opinion, a lot of people always ask, you go back to WWE, who you want to wrestle, who would you, it'll be Dolph. I think he's absolutely one of the best pure wrestlers in that company. Really? So you don't go to Raw, you go to SmackDown. Yeah. What's your gimmick as you come in? Well, again, um, I t Vince called us in, Vince talked to me. One, Vince came up with the Spirit Squad, by the way. Vince McMahon. Really? He was just getting on the airplane, on his Learjet, and he goes, I want to let you know I got an idea, and I, I came up with it. It's my idea, so you're going to make a lot of money. That was exactly what he said. So anyone who criticizes Spirit Squad, they know who to criticize them. But, but look what happened. They immediately went from developmental. And because I said no, two other guys got an opportunity to replace yeah. me. Um, and they made a lot of money. They really did. They were in every major angle. They were f facing off against Flair and Roddy Piper and the Legends and Big Show and Shawn Michaels and Triple H. Do you but, wish you had been involved in it? Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. I absolutely. I, it was my. He gave me the, the choice to make, and I. He res, He respected the fact that I said no. Can you imagine somebody saying, "I decline, Vince. I appreciate it." Yeah. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Were you yeah. nervous to do it? No, I wasn't. I don't know why, but I. I. I just wasn't. It I, wasn't. It wasn't the right fit for you. It just wasn't. It, I. I think he respected me more, for not doing something that I couldn't properly commit to doing. So you go in and you become champion after not too long. Was it ECW champion? No, but the champion was 
excuse me, the championship was I became OVW. OVW champion. Yeah. So when I got up to, I got sent back down to OVW, Vince said, we'll wait till we get something better then for you. Mm -hmm. And when they called me back up, they called me back up to be a manager. Yes. Why do you say yes? I mean, daddy, I mean, if, there, there's a lot of guys that may be able to do the flips, the dives, the top rope maneuvers, uh -huh. and the list goes on. But can't nobody out talk Pope Daddy. So that's why. I mean, in that moment, that's my, I mean, I excel at a lot of things that and I And you knew that was a reason why you could do this as a job, as a career? Oh, well, Because yeah, how yeah. you could talk. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the fact that I was going to be talking, that means I didn't have to get beat up. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, I could save myself. And, and the guy that I was um, managing was Sylvester Turkai. On I remember him. The big, was he Russian? Yeah. The, the, well, he wasn't Russian. He just looks. But that like, was his character, I think. No, he, uh, no, he was an MMA fighter. MMA Legit. fighter, that's right. Legit. Legit. Yeah, no, he, he looked scary. Oh, gosh. You should, you should see some of the guys after he got done wrestling them. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, yeah. it was one of those type things. He didn't last long. He wasn't because he was too brutal in the ring, was it? Um, You're pausing. I, I, I can't answer yes or no to that. That's not my decision. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what their decision was, I, yeah. uh, as I just told you. But it was, I, I was sad to see him go. So after Sylvester Turkai, you start wrestling more at this point? Well, I started wrestling more with Sylvester Turkai yeah. because, the I mean, he was a legit MMA guy. Yeah. And so you have a lot of people in your head saying, be that guy. You know, the, the agents and they wanted him to be that MMA guy, but at the same time, uh, they don't, you, you can't kill the guys that's going to make you money. Yeah. So if, you, if I'm, we're going to put Scott Johnson in the ring with him, we don't want you I to. I don't want him to yeah, kill me. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to. So um, they were actually building Turkai uh, for Undertaker at WrestleMania, and I was really, like, rooting for it. I was kind of excited. I think I remember that. I was like, I was liking that, too. Undertaker is big on MMA, and, yeah. and, and Turkai's a big guy that could stand face-to-face -face with Taker. Yeah. Taker liked to wrestle big guys. And so I would have been, I would have been just as happy um, going to WrestleMania in a managerial role uh, with Turkai because it would have been Taker and probably would have meant more money. Uh, but I was fortunate enough that when Turkai left, uh, they put me in the role as the leader of my own faction called the New Breed. And That's that was right, ECW. the New Breed, and that was kind of where you really shined as the leader of a faction. Yes, sir. Did you enjoy that? Absolutely. We had a blast. All of us got along. Who well, was all on the stable myself, with you? Myself, um, Matt Stryker, Marcus yeah. Corvon, the former Monty Brown of TNA, um, and um, uh, Kevin Thorne. Okay. And yeah. Shelly Martinez, which was his valley. I, rem I remember him. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, we went to WrestleMania, and at the time, uh, we wrestled the originals of ECW: Sabu, RVD, Tommy Dreamer, and um, I believe Sandman. And we wrestled them. Was that exciting to work with those guys? Bro, I mean, these are guys that I grew up watching. You know. Yeah. You know, and not from a kid, but you know, we I was watching them on the Sunshine Network. You uh -huh. know. And so I'm watching ECW at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and, and you know, getting off from work at, at JSO and going to put my VCR tape in. Tell them my age now, right? <laughs> so it was, it was amazing. We wrestled in front of the second largest crowd at the time at Four Field, I think 87,000. Wow. Excuse me, no, eight, 78, 80,000 people. But still huge. That was second only to uh, Andre and Hogan at the time. Yeah, that's really big. So you do a lot of TNA work after that. Yeah. Talk to me about changing your gimmick after you leave WWE. What do you do when you get into TNA? Do you have to change your name because of copyright or? Nope. 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 As a matter of fact, I was, they wanted me to be Elijah Burke. Okay. I mean, why would you not capitalize? Let me back up. You kept your real, your legal name yes. going in. Was that on purpose? Yeah. Well, I, well, I, I can say it was on purpose. Uh, it's certainly something that I wanted. You know, I was Elijah Burke when I, in OVW. Is there any pushback? Because I know Vince likes the name characters. Oh, I mean, again, they're the one brought me, they're the one that let me do it. I mean, okay. is there, you know, it's like, well, what are you going to name this guy? I mean, he's Elijah Burke. Let him be Elijah Burke. Yeah. You know, he, he, ha he's, he's, he has a boxing history. Uh, so we can capitalize off of that. Okay. And so they always talked about my boxing 
you know, and, and my amateur background. Um, it was a blessing to keep my name. Yeah. Not a lot of people get to do that. Yeah, and it was. So you, but you do change your name when you go to TNA. I, I changed my name when I go to TNA only because, again, they wanted me to be Elijah Burke. I wanted to be Pope. When I started in... Why did you want to be Pope? I always, I always wanted to ask, where did the Pope idea come from? Okay, well, um, here, a quick, quick little lesson. I was doing a blog for WWE.com. Okay. And on that, that blog, I would literally write it myself, and then the email is at the bottom, my legit email, uh, ECWHOH at Yahoo.com. And the people would write me. I would check my own. Now, they, the, the creative process, they would normally go through the emails themselves and then, like fan mail, and give you what's okay. I, I got it. I can handle my own stuff. I read every email. Really? I responded to every email. Favorite um, feuds when you went to TNA? Um, well, I'm sorry, back up. I mean, let me fin finish your story. Okay. I'm sorry, finish uh, your story. No problem. I would have got back to it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so they, um, g they, they gave me the emails. I handled my own emails. I responded to these people. And then people, and I'm a bad guy, and people started writing into me with their personal problems. Really? Uh, there's one kid that I remember who was telling me how much I inspired him. Mm -hmm. uh, because he sees someone that looks like him, that's excelling, and he says that I won't let you know that, you know, my gr I stay at my grandma, my grandma, she's fell in health, we're about to get evicted, but I'm, I'm holding on to faith, I appreciate the things that you have told me. Three months later, that kid hit me back up with good news. And so, since all these people, and part of my gimmick was the paragon of virtue, uh, your God and light, your host of hosts. And, and uh, so those yeah. signs are in the audience of SmackDown versus Raw, the video game that I'm on, two of them. Yeah. So you can see the, it in the crowd. So I'm trying to see what, if, if I call these people my congregation, as I started referring to them as, even though they would boo me, you're my congregation, yeah. what can I be? And I didn't want to be a reverend because you already had Reverend Devon. Okay. Right? I didn't want to be... Reverend Slick, I didn't want to be Deacon, you had Deacon Batista. Didn't want to be Brother Love. Didn't want to be a brother, because there's been Brother Love. So I said, there's never been a black pope. Yeah. And, and that's, that was, that's how it was born. that's how it was born. Real quickly on TNA, talk to me about some of your favorite angles, feuds in TNA. Uh, obviously, AJ Styles. Yeah. Um, Can I, you believe how well he's done? Oh, uh, no. I, I, I certainly expect everything that AJ's done. AJ's been great. I mean, it's just a shame it took him so long to get to WWE, you know, but he, he got there finally after ROH and being in Impact and NWA, um, Georgia, and he's, I mean, AJ's the man. I yeah. mean, there's nothing that AJ can't do, and um, me wrestling him, wrestling Samoa Joe, wrestling Devon of uh, the Dudley Boys, uh, feuding with him. Yeah. I had fused with all of them. And those are some of my favorites. And, um, and, and again, being in the ring and with Hogan in TNA and Ric Flair, you know, wrestling Ric Flair in ECW and then working again with Ric Flair in TNA and, you know, getting some punches and chops. And was, I took a on? chop from him once. Oh, word? It was wonderful. Hey, and man. it hurt. It yeah, was great. Yeah, Rick, Rick's the man. Rick's so the man. eventually you start the Love Alive charity here based in Jacksonville. Talk, what is that? Tell me. Everything about Love Alive. Oh, man, I appreciate you for asking. Well, I mean, you, we started off talking about where I grew up. Yeah. And um, it's funny because on my way here to be with you, Scott, <laughs> true story, obviously, I stopped down to the McDonald's downtown on State Union, mm -hmm. whatever, and um, I, I, I go in there just to get a cup of coffee, and as I'm walking in, there's a young, older, but young lady, uh, walking out and she's excuse me sir I'm I'm not I'm not homeless I'm not this I'm not that but you know she gives me this story and she's say I'm just I'm hungry I just really would appreciate I said hey come on come get you something to eat yeah. um and I went in and she said what can I get and she orders a Big Mac she said can I get a combo get what you're gonna get I'm here for a cup of coffee it took me 20 minutes to get that cup of coffee but I got it yeah uh, so so the love alive is based off of that. It's loving individuals uh, while they're alive. So many 
people. I've walked across as a kid uh, going to the local Winn-Dixie that's now Harvey's. I used to walk there as a kid to get our cereal. And there used to be uh, homeless people on the sidewalks, as they, st they still are now down there. And they would ask a kid for some change. And, you know, mom may have left $5 out because she was working a double shift yeah. to go get some cereal and milk. And so whatever I had left, I gave it. And I always said to myself that if... I was ever so fortunate to be in a position to where I could help the community, uh, then I'm going to do that. And, 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 and Love Alive Charity does wrestling events. Tell me about yes. those and how people can learn about them. Yeah, uh, we, we, we don't just do wrestling events. The wrestling events are a supplication of sorts. It's a way to help sustain uh, because for years I've, and even now, I do it out of my pocket. Um, so I, I'm not... I'm not funded by the government. The Love Life Charity is not funded. We're 501c3. We're all of that. We're in Tallahassee, but we don't have the, you know, we don't have that resource coming in. So we operate off of the donation of others. And so I always encourage people, even if it's just a dollar, it helps make a difference. And that's why uh, a couple of friends of mine got together one day and said, why don't you do a wrestling event? You know, and, and that way uh, people can come and give to the charity, and it gives them a reason to and want to if come. people are watching and want to go help the Love Alive charity, how do they get in touch? They can go to love-alive.org, uh, or they can, um, they can donate via Cash App, uh, money signed to Love Alive charity. Uh, on our website, it tells you everything. It sh we, we show the videos. We feed three to 400. One time, we had people all the way around the block on State Street uh, at... Burger King. We don't feed them out of a brown bag. Yeah. We don't feed them out of a, a, a soup truck. We feed them the things that we often take for granted. Quick, quick backup, reverse. I was in the parking lot. I was talking to a family member at the McDonald's that I just went to. This was 10 plus years ago. And I saw somebody drive through the drive through throw something in the trash, and after they finally pulled it off, as I'm talking to my family member, I see this man walk, take the lid off, go through, finds what was left over, and start eating it. Yeah. It was at that moment, it was at that very moment that I said, I'm doing something. We have a lot of prominent people that I appreciate here in Jacksonville, and there's a lot of people that do a lot of things. I just feel that we can do a lot more. Well, Elijah Burke, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to get back on the show down there. There's so much more to unpack yeah, yeah. with you, and we'll have you on another time. But Elijah Burke, thanks for joining us today, Elijah. I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. So we want to thank Elijah for coming on. Great guy. We hope to have him back on the show. And we did get some input from him on some upcoming shows. First, we got a Hulk Hogan episode coming up. Uh, if you want the details, check out TikTok. Uh, in Instagram at going ringside. He's going to weigh in on that because he did have a lot of dealings with Hogan when they were in TNA together. Also, uh, Devon Dudley, because we're going to do a Dudley Boys episode. We talked to Devon. We're going to have him come on an upcoming episode. And he had a big feud with Devon Dudley in TNA. We're going to talk a little about that in an upcoming episode. But Elijah had so much interesting um, perspective on this industry. First, talking what Ric Flair and particularly Dusty Rhodes in the 70s and 80s really m meshed with the black viewers. Maybe a way a very heavily white promotion didn't, but Dusty Rhodes did. It was kind of interesting to hear his perspective there. And then, of course, like in guys like JYD and stuff like that, as he grows up, becomes a police officer, and then decides, I want to be a pro wrestler. And Vince, I did not know, wanted him in the Spirit Squad. Spirit Squad was over for the time. They were a good heel faction, but Elijah Burke saying, it just wasn't for me, it wasn't right, it didn't feel right, and he told Vince no. I have not seen a lot of guys, particularly coming in, who said to Vince McMahon, I don't like that idea, I don't wanna do it. But he did, you gotta give him credit for that. And then he did a lot with TNA and his Love Alive charity does a lot in Jacksonville. We try and get information about their shows here on Going Ringside when we can. Um, but we are working once again to get a Hulk Hogan episode coming in short order, maybe with the Hulkster himself. We'll keep you posted on that. But thanks for joining us again for another episode of Going Ringside.
This has been Going Ringside with the local station. Brought to you every Wednesday on your favorite podcast player. On News 4 Jax Plus, as well as the News 4 Jax YouTube channel. 